Welcome everybody to episode 11 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. And I am Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on with the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In well said. The, thank you very much. Kind of getting back into the swing of it here. In today's show, we're going to be talking about Drew's experience at the DC Pen Show last weekend, if we should do a Goulet brick and mortar store, and resin versus plastic versus celluloid versus whatever other fancy name there might be for those things. We got some other questions and some fun hypotheticals for you as well. Probably first thing you're going to notice is that Drew and I are in different locations, just like we were kind of in the beginning of the pen cast thing. That's because we got this COVID stuff going on and the Delta variants kicking back up. And in our local area in central Virginia, we are considered to be in a high uh, transmissibility area. So we are taking extra precautions, wanting to be abundantly safe, even though Drew and I are both vaccinated. The Delta variant can be passed through vaccinated folks. So we both have younger kids and we wanna be safe. So we're just, out of an abundance of caution, shooting remotely until it is clear to do otherwise. So uh, we had initially talked and hyped up several weeks ago about like, yeah, as soon as August starts, we're going to start doing the Pencast weekly again. And now we're like, um, are we going to be able to do that? I don't know. So we're going to take it a week at a time here, folks. And we're going to give it a shot uh, with today with doing it remotely again. So yeah, maybe we'll be back every week. Maybe we won't. But uh, check our Instagram page. If we're not having a Pencast, I will let you know. There you go. Uh, we're going to try to do it, though. I don't know. We'll see. The theory originally was that if we do it every week, maybe they'd be shorter and we talk less. But we've proven that that is not the case. We have uh, what is known as the uh, Parkinson's law, which is, uh, you know, any work you do will fill the time allotted for it. So if Drew and I do a pencast every week, we're going to do a full pencast every week. <laughs> and it's not going to be like twice as often, half as much. Nope. It's not how we roll. Anyway. Yeah. We are better about our meetings, though. Once we figured out about that concept, we did apply it to our meetings. And I will say the meetings we have at the Goulet Pen Company are usually pretty timely. They are. I we're think pretty good about that. I'm, my theory, Drew, is that with the pen cast that just we're getting a little less like social time together. So I think we just kind of like let it fly a little bit when we That's do it. That's probably Cause it's, it. Because it's just enjoyable for us. You know what I mean? Contributing factors. Yes, sir. Exactly. Exactly. Brian, would you like some feedback? Absolutely. You know, I love me some feedback. Let's feed some back. All right. Well, going back to the last episode where you said, hey, everybody, would you like to see or listen to me talk about all the random crap in the back of my office? <laughs> um, the, the the verbatim request for yes to the random crap in the back, uh, that was a pervasive theme in the comment <laughs> section of our last video. Thank so you, thank the you. random crap in the back tour uh, is in high demand, sir. So once we get back into the office, uh, normal. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, um, great timing. Yeah, Just great yeah. timing on our part. Once yeah. once we get back in there, we will, uh, we'll pull some things out. Maybe I will uh, curate some things unbeknownst to Mr. Goulet, and he can talk about them with... Um, genuine surprise and i got a couple i got a couple i can share today just to tease a little bit but we can do a more full thing at some other point cool well done um and in conjunction with our hypothetical from last week where i asked brian if he could pick any movie car to own he uh we got some good picks there as well ah. there was a couple uh, recommendations for james bond's aston martin which of i know course, you would be a fan of, of as well the yeah. Jurassic Park Jeep, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Kit from Knight Rider, and of course the Back to the Future DeLorean. All good answers. Of course, of course. And you were trying, Brian, to think of a red color that started with a C, and you said Carillion a few times. Um, and I said, I think that's actually a planet in Star Wars <laughs> yes. lore. Um, yes, I was uh, very I uncertain about that. <laughs> Uh, you were probably searching for carnelian that came out in our comments. Carnelian is the color, is the actual name of the color? Yeah. And I said Corellian? Yeah. That's very possible. I have no idea what I said. Yeah. So, But anyway, I, what I did learn during the podcast, I was like, I'm pretty sure that's where Han Solo is from. And I believe the Millennium Falcon is a Corellian um, freighter. And I was right about that because a fellow Star Wars nerd in the comments said, yes, Drew, it is Corellian. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. So, fair enough. Fair enough. Yay. Uh, and then I also mentioned how I wanted a little pirate accordion <laughs> and I was correct. Not the official term for it. <laughs> no, no. The official term is called a concertina. And, yes. um, 
I still want one. And that led me to look them up on the internets. And they're actually not super cheap, Brian. They're about 250 bucks or more. Uh, so that, that feels are, very reasonable for me because there's a lot of parts in there. There's a lot of things happening yeah, there's inside a, there. So I also watched some YouTube videos, maybe. Uh, and oh, no. Of, Did you fall you down know, a rabbit hole with concertinas? I kind of love pirate shanties. Ever since I played Assassin's Creed 4, like, okay. I'm, I really, really like them. But some of these videos I saw, Brian, they were playing toy accordions. And they actually sounded pretty good. Huh. So I went, I went on the old internet machine as well and bought myself a $28 toy accordion. So that should wow. be here tonight. So I will let you know how that goes and how much my wife appreciates that purchase. So you were literally inspired by your own idea in the podcast. Uh, that's pretty cool. Okay. Let me know how that goes, man. I'm curious. When you talk about like a toy, you know, concertina, it makes me think of uh, Jimmy Fallon when he's done the like, uh, what is it? He has like bands come on and they play yeah, their, well, their the, songs the, with uh, toy instruments. Yeah. The, the Roots uh, do it and they're all like exceptionally talented and they sound amazing. Oh yeah. But they had like Metallica on there and they played oh, them with like right. toys and they've had a bunch of different bands on there. It's pretty that's funny. Right. Pretty that funny. That's really cool. That's what I'm picturing so, with you with that. So you, so, so Archer can have the ukulele and you'll have the concertina. Is that how it's going to yeah, go? Yeah. As long, as long as we play, you are my sunshine over and over again, we'll probably, uh, we'll have something. Go, nice. Go do some, do some weddings. Yeah. Nice. That's really cool. Um, yeah, for me, the feedback mainly, I just kind of jumped on the whole crap in the back um, <laughs> thing. Uh, so Matthew Chavon, forgive me if I pronounced that wrong, um, on YouTube said, uh, interested in the framed image that was behind Brian about three years ago, specifically in the thumbnail image for Q&A 188. Um, so yeah, if you look back throughout the history of my videos, you'll see how many times I've moved off to this is rearranged things, redecorated, that kind of stuff. So I'm glad you left the reference there. Um, so that is actually an, uh, artwork, uh, from Jake Weidman, master penman, good friend of mine. Uh, and that specifically is now actually hanging. If you look at some of our right nows, it's hanging in the background of those. It's hanging like on my sidewall in my office. Um, that is his craftsmanship piece of artwork and craftsmanship is a big theme in my life. I love building things, working with my hands, all that kind of stuff. So that's why I have that. And, uh, that, that specific video, I had it behind me because I hadn't yet decided where I was going to hang it. So if there was a couple of episodes there where I had that one behind me, but yeah, you'll see some of Jake's work, uh, in and around. I've got some at home. I've got some at work. Um, and then the other one was, uh, from a 22 Lottie. Very interested in that Lego rocket over on the side. And I think there's some more Lego around the desk. So yeah, definitely I'm a huge Lego, specifically Lego Technic fan, um, which actually leads to me, uh, what I've been doing up to personally, but I'll save that towards the end of the pen cast. Um, but yeah, that is the Saturn V rocket. So that was the one that uh, took the um, first astronauts to the moon. It's also the largest rocket that has been flown in space before, right, Drew? Still, yep. I know the. Yep. They're, the, they're uh, working on something bigger, maybe, but it hasn't actually gone yeah, into this, orbit this, yet. Yeah, the Starship will be bigger, but so far yeah. the Saturn V reigns supreme. There you go. So that's what that is. It is a super cool set. It was really fun to build. Even if you're not like super into space, I like I like space, but I'm not as much of a space nerd like Drew and many others. I appreciate it. I like it. But just as a Lego set, that one was a lot of fun to build. And I highly recommend it if you are interested in it. So very, very cool. So anyway, that's that's a couple of things in the background there. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about some new stuff, some coming soon product wise. New we, stuff. Uh, yeah, the Diplomat Arrow is a really, really popular pen. It's like a flagship mm -hmm. pen for Diplomat. And uh, we had a, I don't know, a really unique color that just came out, the Citrus. Now, this is a color that probably will get your attention one way or another. May not be your cup of tea. Rachel, when she saw it, I thought she was going to vomit, but um, she does not love that color. <laughs> I like it. I think it looks nice. It's really striking. I think you're, you, you, you're, whether you love it or hate it, you're going to have a reaction to seeing that pen. Um, so very cool. I'd love to see Diplomat coming out with it, especially because we know, Drew, that this is an uh, aluminum pen. And the only way to color these things, uh, the way that they do it is anodizing. And you can't just anodize any color you want. There's like physical properties that will limit what colors are possible. And uh, I've never seen... Uh, an anodized pen in this color. The, probably the closest thing I've seen was the Lamy All-Star. Do you remember the charged green? 
It is yeah. sort of like that color. Um, I haven't actually like held them up side by side to see how close they are, but um, that's probably the closest that I can think. So. Yeah, you don't generally see the lighter colors getting anodized. Right, right. I think it's just easy. It's probably easier to get it more uniform if it's a dark color. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of just, you know, I'm interested to see how that is received. I don't expect it to be like the most popular color by any means. Um, but still, I always love seeing interesting, exciting things coming uh, from Diplomat. Uh, another pen that this one is, I think, very aptly named. This is coming from Paniter. This is straight out of the brain of Dante Del Vecchio, the Psycho. Now, this is a high-end limited edition pen. This thing, I don't even know really how to describe it. it you just look at it and you're like, this pen looks psychotic. I mean, <laughs> it's so... Uh, intense in its design. It's not a design. It's not a printed design. It's not a pattern that's on the pen. You're looking at a three-dimensional structure of a pen. I don't. I guess that's how to describe it. Sort of like you have. I don't know. Like the Eiffel Tower is constructed with like all these like posts and beams and that kind of stuff, and it makes a rigid structure. It's kind of like that. But I. I literally don't know how they made this pen. I, I believe it was a lost wax casting of some kind. Um, you know, but. There's so many like little intricate parts and pieces. And I mean, it's like you can, if you pull the like internal mechanism out, you can like take a toothpick and like stick it through the whole pen. Cause it's like, it's, it's all just held together by its structure, but it's very solid. Right. Um, Cause I think it's uh it's silver, right. Overlaid with, um, you know, gold maybe, or, or whatever it is. I don't know what the, what the core material is. They did have all I three say it's, I say it's colors. Silver on display at the DC Penn show. So, you know, I was okay. able to see them all right there. Um, they had like an official unveiling at the DC Penn show. Um, it is it is an incredible pen. And honestly, I think you did a good job in describing it like the Eiffel Tower. To me, that's what it looks like. It looks like if you took the Eiffel Tower and turned it in and like wrapped it around a pen barrel. That's, right? that's, that's the vibe I get. Yeah, it's crazy. But it feels very sturdy, right? Like you're, oh, you don't very. like, I imagine if you like tried to like hold no. it and crush the thing it wouldn't be great for it but i think it's it it, it feels incredibly it feels straight. It, does, it does not feel like the um the paniter uh honeycomb the paniter honeycomb felt fragile it was very nice yeah. it felt like you were holding like a piece of artwork that you're not supposed to write with but this one definitely does not feel like that it feels like you could drop it on the floor it would be fine well and, and that don't. one the honeycomb that one was resin too this one is metal yeah it's very very sturdy um and it's expensive you're pushing you know closer to three grand to get this pen so it's not going to be everybody's carry around pen but i think just like any other kind of artistic limited edition type pen. It's just cool to see some envelope pushing happening. And, uh, you know, if Dante is good at anything, it's at pushing the envelope and coming up with yes. crazy designs. So yes. it's really cool. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see how these ones are received as well, but it just looks wild. Wild. Yeah, I, I love the fact that he does that. I don't think that we need more than one of him in the pen industry, but I'm glad <laughs> that we do have one. Well, he cannot be duplicated, so I think we're safe no, there. No, he cannot. Uh, <laughs> he certainly uh, and, cannot. And then the other one that was pretty interesting, I guess I'm introducing all the really wild pens today, um, the Sailor 110th Anniversary. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, the reason why Sailor has a pen called the 1911 is because that's the year that they were founded. Uh, so being that it's 2021, they did a 110th anniversary pen. And this one just looks so different than any other Sailor pen. They really did a deviation from their standard design, which I think some people have strong feelings about that. They're like, this doesn't even feel like Sailor. What is going on? Other people are like, you know, I'm so glad to see them trying something different. So I'm kind of curious where you fall in terms of the design of the pen, Drew. Are you digging it or are you like, I don't know, or are you conflicted? I I felt this I felt the way you just described. I opened it Conflicted. up and I'm like, this is not a sailor pen. This is a telephone pole with a nib on it. <laughs> and I, it, wow. I mean, if wow. you if you, it's it's enormous. It's just a giant tube. It is it is bigger in person than I expected. Yeah, given, it's given a big the pictures pen. and stuff. It's huge. Yeah. There's no there's no um there's no curvature to it at all. It's just a it's just a cylinder. It's simply a cylinder. It's 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 a nice, pretty cylinder with a creative roll stop. I feel like if they if they just shrunk that thing down a bit, mm. I think it'd be fun. And I honestly like the design. I, you know, I like the simplicity. You know what? It kind of looks like a Lamy, doesn't it? It's got kind of a little bit of that design if, element if you, to if it. You, it's if got if a you handed me house kind of a yeah, flair if you handed me it. that pen and said which brand makes this, I'd be like Lamy, yeah, maybe you, Diplomat. 
Yeah, it definitely has more of a like German, like European vibe than yeah. maybe a Japanese vibe. But you know what? I think it's cool. I think they're trying different stuff. Um, you know, it's a super limited pen. There's not a whole ton of them. Uh, so I think they were just probably going for something, you know, a little out there, which, you know, hey, I, I got to commend them for that. So, yeah. um, you know, there's a silver one and a black one. Um, they're both, uh, they have the uh, large size 1911 uh, nib on it. So again, if you are trying to get a basis of the size of that pen, just take that pen from the like mid-size 1911 uh, and tr translate that to the pen, like Drew said, the kind of telephone pole wrapped around the nib. <laughs> it's really large. Um, but anyway, I, I just, I'm, I'm kind of torn. I'm not like over the moon, like, wow, this is the pen I would have chosen to, to design. But at the same time, I have a lot of pens. I have a lot of limited edition type things that have come out, anniversary type stuff from different companies. And I always think it's really interesting when a company, like rather than just like a different color of a pen they've always made, they really try to deviate. I'm like, I, I appreciate the effort if nothing else. And so I'm a little inclined to at least consider it just for that fact that it's different and that it's, you know, it's, it feels a little more historical, you know what I mean? Than just like, I completely agree. Than just like a different color of a 1911, you know? Yeah. That would be but, disappointing. I agree. Well, yeah. so anyway. What do you got, Drew? You've been playing um, some stuff. Well, actually, we've got another right on the heels of Private Reserve's um, uh, uh, um, Infinity Ink. We have yeah. a line of pearlescent inks. So Private Reserve is jumping into the shimmer pool, and they <laughs> are pretty interesting. So I'm going to hold up a piece of paper. Hopefully, I can get it to uh, be seen here. Um, I'm, I'm visualizing jumping yeah. into a shimmer pool and what you would look like. <laughs> I'm picturing. Uh, yeah, I can't. The, the camera's not picking it up super well, but I'll put an image <laughs> over of like a cell phone shot or something like that. We're taking pictures as we speak, but they come in turquoise, blue, orange, red, black, and violet, and it's a pretty unique um, mixture because the pearlescent flakes material, whatever's floating around in there that makes it do its thing, is very very fine. So the shimmer shows up very uniformly. I, a lot of the inks that I've tested. You know, they have a, you know, really, really shimmery spot and then a not so shimmery spot sometimes. This one, it's shockingly uniform and it looks a lot like those shimmery gel pens. Yeah, like the, the ever... milky pens from the yes. 90s, right? Yes, absolutely. They look just like that. So I think people are going to like it. It's a unique pen. There's a lot of shimmer. So some of that shimmer, you know, sits on top of the paper because that stuff doesn't really go into the fibers of yeah, the paper. Yeah, it's, like, so it's it, a pigment. It's not a dye. Yeah, it's, it's going to sit on top. It's so not absorbing you, into the paper at all. Exactly. So if you take your thumb to it and like rub it later, you'll get some dusting on your fingers, you know, but that's the that case with yeah. a lot of ink. I wonder if um, you, uh, I know we haven't experimented with this, Drew, but I wonder if you dilute that down, does that help with that aspect of it? I would have to imagine that it would. It's not going to make it worse. Yes. So it's a neat ink, and I think that folks are going to enjoy it. So that came across my desk, so that was fun to play around with. And we are also going to be picking up new colors for the Pilot Explorer, which is a lot of fun, because that pen, in my opinion, is probably the most underrated starter pen. It is. It gets overshadowed so much. It doesn't get the attention I feel that it deserves, especially right. because it takes one of the best converters in the world, Drew, the Con 70, which I know you're personally such a huge fan of. The Con 70 is a great <laughs> empty cartridge. Oh, come on. It's great to syringe fill because it has a great capacity. But uh, I, sadly, I like, I like the Con sadly, 70. it just doesn't convert anything because it's, it's got a stupid button on it that doesn't really work all the time. Anyway, is it the button? That's <laughs> no, I'm just, stupid? I'm just, I'm jabbing at you. I, I, I don't have a problem with the Con 70. I just think it's hard to clean, so eh, I avoid well, it. Well, I'll give, I'll give a little shout out. It is not the easiest thing to clean. I'll give you that. Yeah. Though, if you clean it with a syringe, that helps a lot. Just take the syringe see. and like flush it through the opening. That's the easiest way mm. to clean it. I try to like get a syringe right up to the little tiny metal pipe that's inside because I feel like if I inject water into that, somehow it's like you know, hitting the bullseye on something. And I, I have it in my mind that that's like me winning. I don't, I don't know. think that makes a difference, but it, if it makes you feel good, Drew, then it does. You know, good on you. Live your best life. Thank you. It um, does. But I will give a shout out. So I did a video on how to fill the new Con 70 because they did change over earlier this year. Mm -hmm. There may still be in transition in certain parts of the world and with different pens that may be sitting around for a while. 
Um, but the new one, you got to hold it. You got to hold it straight up to get the good fill. So I can very much understand if people feel passionate about not being able to fill that pen because it is very particular about the yeah. the angle that you do it. But once you get it straight up, it's so easy and so good. Yep. Among the new colors of the Explorer, we've got a black matte, which people always love. But my favorite is going to be the white glossy pen with the black matte hardware because a lot of folks have enjoyed the black and white vanishing point for a very long time yes. as the unofficial Stormtrooper pen. And I have not bought that one. But don't, I will don't, be buying... don't, don't copyright strike us, Disney. It's the uh, no. sp space soldier pen, Drew, is space, what we should call yes. it. Yes. Disposable, disposable, <laughs> inept space soldier pen. <laughs> That's right. Um, put, them, so... put them up there with like, uh, you know, Bond villain henchmen for their accuracy of shooting, right? Oh, so sad. <laughs> so sad. But they have a black and white one on this one, too. And that is appealing. It looks, it looks slick. It looks slick. It does. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, speaking of empty cartridges, uh, we are going to be carrying a new product from Private Reserve, which might not get you excited. Maybe it does. I don't know. But for a while, folks have been asking for just empty cartridges because that's how a lot of writers use their pen. They just refill empty cartridges. Mm -hmm. But... Sometimes the process of wanting to empty out a cartridge is it's either full of an ink they don't want to use or whatever. But Private yeah. Reserve is going to be selling um, a uh, pack of empty cartridges <coughs> for you to use as you see fit. So we'll be picking those up. Um, yeah. So just this is, more on that as it develops. This is interesting because we've been getting asked... <laughs> I mean, really, ever since the beginning of when we started Goulet Pens, we've been getting asked about refilling ink cartridges. How do I make my own ink cartridges, et cetera? Because, you know, I don't think it's I think in, in especially in other parts of the world, we talked about this before with like the, the new Twisby swipe and about other, you know, uh, the Pilot Metropolitan or the MR, right? How like in parts of Europe, it's much more common to use cartridges than, say, here in the U.S., which is mainly a bottle using uh, community so I think um, it's something that, you know, if you're using a brand like Noodler's as an example, Nathan doesn't believe in disposable cartridges. So he does not offer any of his inks in disposable cartridges. So people, if they want to use, you know, Heart of Darkness or Base Day Blue or whatever in a cartridge pen, they either have to eyedropper fill it or refill cartridges. But the problem is if you can't get spare cartridges, you have to get some other cartridges, either use them or dump them clean them out, then reuse them. But the problem is they're disposable. So over time, as you use them, they're going to break down and not seal well and maybe crack if you squeeze them and that kind of stuff. So it's like, it's always been kind of a challenge for people that want to use these cartridges for whatever reason to actually be able to do so practically. So this is the first time that I can remember in the you know 12 or so years that I've been really around in the community that I've ever seen disposable spare cartridges available for sale. So good on PR for at least offering that. I'm curious to see if this is something that people really value. Um, and if so, you know, hey, that'd be really cool. Maybe we could encourage other brands to do it. Because again, these are standard international. They won't fit all pens, of course. Um, but the, uh, the thing that I asked the folks at PR when they first offered these, I asked them, I was like, okay, one thing is just being able to fill a cartridge and you stick it right on the pen. But I obviously part of the appeal would be to actually fill your own cartridges so that you could cart them around with you and have them as spares to like just pop into the pen. There's a higher convenience factor there. So if you're traveling or whatever. Um, but the problem is there's no good way to seal the end, right? So when you're buying new cartridges, they've got that little ball and it's like vacuum sealed or whatever the heck, however it's adhered in there, there's no like at home practical way to do that. Um, they didn't have an answer for me for that, but I at least expressed to them that maybe that's something people would be interested in. So to keep their, their eyes open. Um, the one thing that I'll say that I've heard for people that want to basically create their own cartridges that can be used at a later time, like a disposable cartridge, um, is a hot glue gun. So using hot glue to seal up the end after you've filled the cartridge, you know, it's going to be questionable as to how durable that might be if you're just carrying it around loosely. But if you have like a somewhat protected case or way or tin or whatever, you know, like an Altoids tin or like something like that, where it's not going to get crushed or something like that, that might work for you. But again, I've only heard this like here and there throughout the, the years that that could possibly work. I've never really tested it myself, but I would love to know if anybody actually tries that. Let me know how that works, the whole hot glue gun thing on the end of a cartridge. And if that's a practical solution, we should probably talk about that more. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I think that someone could do would be to, well, I guess I wouldn't want them to rip off Nathan's design, but some like he came up with a 
perfect idea with his 308 cartridges that he has for the Ahabs. Mm -hmm. Something, a concept like that, a, a standard international size, like let's say it's the size of a converter, but that has a threaded opening that you can thread a cap onto, mm -hmm. and then a, thre a threaded rear section that you could then thread the cap onto for storage. That would be a perfect solution to it. You just need to do it in a not Ahab size, do it in a standard international size. Yeah, and that's interesting because the because the Ahab is a piston pen, but it's a removable piston. That already is kind of unique. Yeah. But the threading's on the inside on that one. I'm not aware of any just cartridges aside from that specific Noodler's Ahab one. I'm not aware of any cartridges that have any threading on them. I believe they're all push type. So Well, you could also make it know. a plug, you know. Yeah, a plug of some kind or like you Yeah, know, but it would just it would need to go on the back too for storage. It would have to like go like stretch around the back with like a rubber band or something like that. I don't know. It's interesting. Well it's interesting. the 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 uh you could have it two sided. One side is the th is the plug that goes in the front, the other side is, you know, uh you know, another end that can plug onto the back, like a male to female and then flopped. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. Someone invent that please, but give Nathan <laughs> credit and talk to him first. There you go. <laughs> Still, it's cool to see new options and new things coming out in the community. So that's cool. Yes. Yes, yeah. indeed. Um, and finally, uh, Platinum is coming out with a new limited edition series of preppy pens. So I mean, I'm sure I just popped on that one. Sorry about that. Preppy pens. And this is called the Preppy Wah. Wow. And I don't know what that means. I'm sure I could have looked that up. But essentially, they're preppies with cute, adorable goal. Cute, adorable, fun, and whimsical designs emblazoned upon them. Yeah. So, and they're like a colored demo body. So that's kind of fun and interesting, especially if you like to make your ink matchy matchy with the pen. It's much more I obvious to do so. I actually don't know if they're demos, Brian. I think are they, they might... solid? I thought they were demo. Maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, I've maybe only... they are a little. Maybe they are a little demo. No, maybe I think you're right. I think you're right. I think they are a little demo. On okay, the so image, I've, I've only seen pictures. I haven't seen them in person. On the image myself, with a yeah. lot of them, they look demoy. But on the single images, they look. No, they're demoy. You're right. You're absolutely right. Okay. You're good. Good. It's always. It's always I didn't know nice. that. It's always nice when we can retroactively yeah. confirm that I said something correctly. Yeah, I didn't. I did not know that. I thought they were solid. Okay. I don't know if I like that more or less. Let's go with more. Sure. I like them more as a translucent because that's part of what I like about the preppy, especially because they're such a good eyedropper candidate. I like it's, being able to see the ink level in the pen, whether you're using a cartridge converter or eyedropper. So to me, that's cool. I like that. Now, this black one doesn't look transparent at all. The black one might be kind of dark. The blacks and the blues usually maybe are yeah. darker with translucent pens, but... I don't Either know. way, maybe we neat. should uh, know what we're talking about before we start. They are talking a little more them. expensive than the standard preppy at seven dollars and twenty cents. But that's a fair compromise, that's, I think. That's the price for whimsy. Yeah. Now the converter, unfortunately, costs more than the pen, which is yeah. not the best. But hey, that's where you can refill cartridges or do an eyedropper or just there bite we the go. Bullet and bite the bullet and get the converter. There the we go. They do last a while. How All about right. we move on to Q and A? I think it's time, Drew. Q and A. All I vote right. That uh, you start with the first one, since your name is. Brian. I will start with the first one. So this question is from Karis, and Karis asks, "I am sure that this question has been answered several times in previous videos, but I can't remember the answer. You, as a business, seem to be doing very well. So why not have a brick and mortar store? Why do you choose to only sell on the internet, Brian?" Yeah, we've definitely talked about this before, but that's okay. You know, I don't expect everybody to watch 1800 videos over 11 years. Um, I'm at the point where I can't even remember what we've done. So I am more than fine just answering a question again, especially because it's contextual, right? So um, part of it was organic, especially in the beginning. Uh, we had no means financially or practically to even consider a physical store. So that choice is basically made for us. Um, you know, when you're talking about a brick and mortar store, you have to really think about your local area. Uh, and your local, our local area here just isn't that big on fountain pen usage. There was no sign or indication that establishing a brick and mortar fountain pen store would have been a intelligent idea from a business standpoint. Um, our original vision was to be strictly online to fill a void that existed in the fountain pen world. And I would say that we've largely executed that to a pretty, pretty high degree. Yeah. At, um, at the time there were fewer. Yes, absolutely. It was very, I mean, this is 2009 we're talking about here it was highly speculative, this whole online fountain pen thing. And just e-commerce in general was still not like a given. 
Um, surprisingly, even now, it's not a given. It's still most of the world is buying brick and mortar. Uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, we wanted to really focus on online education and service because we knew that we would just be able to reach so many more people uh, by doing so. And, you know, specifically by focusing on things like video, you know, just as one example, Drew and I can sit down and we can plan this video. We put several hours of prep into this, but then once it's up, it's out there available to anybody who can access it on the internet, on YouTube. And it's there in perpetuity until it gets taken down or we take it down. So it keeps on working for us and all of our videos are doing that. So for me, just the practicality of really the original vision, which was to help get more education and knowledge about fountain pens out there into the world as much as possible, you know, really focusing online and focusing specifically on video blog, you know, that kind of education um, standpoint, that was by far the most effective way that we can consider to do that. Uh, and I would say that in order to do that well, we had to have a high degree of focus and focus not only in the product line, which is specifically fountain pens. We've tried at times to get dabble a little bit in pencils, dabble a little bit in, you know, calligraphy stuff. I'm talking, this is all very long time ago. Dabble Planners. A little bit in rollerballs, planner, some of these things. We've tried to like expand into some kind of tangential, you know, interest that we thought, you know, might be good. But what we found is that like, it's a whole other world, you know, and for, <laughs> for us to do things like the Goulet way, we would have to go kind of all in on any other kind of area that we would look to get into. Like we're just so known and so established in fountain pens. It was a kind of thing like, well, for us to do that, we would really have to be purely a fountain pen focused thing. And I can guarantee you if we had a brick and mortar store, people would see Goulet pens, they would come in and they'd be like, you don't carry roller balls. You don't, you know, it's like, I think in a physical brick and mortar store, when people think pens, they would be thinking, you know, gift pens, corporate things, rollerball, that type of stuff. It's a whole different type of product that you're selling. And it would just really just take a lot of our focus away. So um, it would be time and focus, attention, money, all those resources that would divert away from fountain pens when we saw that there was such a crying need for spe specifically fountain pen focused education on the internet. And then I think just in general, like, you know, Rachel, Rachel's, she's surprisingly introverted given um, how much you see her on video and how good she comes across. But like, for her to work a brick and mortar store, she would never work the floor. It's just not who she is. And so that would stress her out having to manage like that in-person aspect of things. So it has just never been a desire um, really of either of us for various reasons, but for Rachel, it would, it would not be a desire of hers. So I think you could argue that like a, having a bigger team now, having more resources, we certainly could revisit that. And it certainly could be an option. Of course, with COVID, it's like, why in the world would we do that right now? But, um, you know, I have a lot of respect for folks like Anderson Pens, like Truffet, who started online, had a vision for a physical store and really a passion for it. And from what I hear, do it really well. So I've never been to physical, their physical stores, but I hear good things about them. So like more power to them, I think it's commendable because it does take so much just energy and focus to make it happen at all, let alone try to run an online store and a physical store. It's almost like you're running two companies. Um, but I think for us, it's just not practical. It's not something that we're looking to do. And it would just take our eye off the ball a little bit. So, um, you know, it would come off too high, too high of a, a cost for us for just our attention, focus, our family, those types of things. So um, I'm not going to say like, no, it would never happen because I'm not like fundamentally opposed to it as a concept. It just hasn't made sense for us at this point, given all of everything I just talked about. There we go. And we'd have to work weekends and weekends and nights. Yeah, that would be uh, that would be difficult because that that would be different. Literally, no one wants to do that like ever in our company, which is <laughs> no. fine because we all have families and like it makes total sense. Like it's a huge perk we have. Yeah. You wouldn't um, get a lot of volunteers for that one here. Yeah, we'd make Drew do it. How about that? Drew would yeah, come probably in would. And be super personable and nice and wacky. But you have to listen to my toy accordion when you're shopping. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> You'd be like the uh, like the uh, the the um, the waiter in uh, Lady and the Tramp, right? That's uh, what, more that's more, what more I'm like picturing. a more like a monkey that's like slamming <laughs> symbols together. But thank you <laughs> with the little toy accord. Yeah, with the toy, yeah. the toy concertina. Yeah. Concertina. Don't, yes. Don't don't overvalue me yet. <laughs> All right. Yes. All right. Next question. Uh, this one's for me. So, um, from Miochi. Uh, what are each of your top three most often used movie or TV quotes? Oh, I see why you picked this one, Drew, because this is like, this is right up your alley, man. Yeah, I kind of, <laughs> I speak 
in quotes a lot of the times and i'm not shy about throwing them out there because you never know who might get it a lot of the times i throw them out there and no one gets it but every now and then you'll throw out an ex- obscure one and somebody will give you that look be like yeah i got you and you're like yes my people excellent i love those those feelings but really it's too many to count and c- coming down to top three would be really difficult um we were uh, we're kind of rewatching uh, drunk history on hulu and um it, we came across recently my wife and i came across recently one of the quotes we use all the time and it's very obscure but craig um Craig Kukowski is a uh, guy who played the police officer that would always show up in community. And he also played, you know, supporting roles in all of the drunk history skits. I love the guy. But he, in the Abraham Lincoln episode, just looks at the camera. And obviously, he's being voiced over by the drunk comedian. But he says, what are you doing? (laughs) And... We just say that all the time. Whenever somebody, whenever we're like, "What are you doing?" We say it in the Craig Kakowski way, and um, so that one shows up a lot. Uh, and also, for some reason, whenever anybody says pumpkin, I have to quote Tracy Jordan from Thirty Rock when he says, "Did he just say pumpkin to me?" <laughs> because he was That's right, he the was pumpkin he was, ravioli. Yes, he would. All he was offered pumpkin ravioli. It was the pilot episode, episode one. Yes, and then. So, I mean, whenever pumpkin comes up, why not say that? You know, someone just said pumpkin to you. It's a very specific quote that always comes to mind. And then finally, uh, like Brian just said about the brick and mortar store, one popped in there because you knew say it would take our attention away from, you know, what we're supposed to do. Whenever you want to tell somebody to focus, you say, keep your eye on the tiger, which is obviously a misquote from Eye of the Tiger. But Christopher Moltisanti, um, who is Michael Imperioli's character from the greatest show of all time sopranos he was often misquoting things trying to sound intelligent but he was really just flubbing it up so i like to use that one um keep your eye on the tiger nice Chrissy. awesome i actually had to think about this one a little bit i definitely have like shows that i will quote because yeah know you me, quote all you quote office a lot you you, <clears throat> you often do the uh i do a lot of the office why yeah. are you the way you are <laughs> There's just so many good memes. What gives you the right? Like Who, you throw you throw that one out there a lot. Yeah, the when yeah when Mike when Michael does the uh, Toby exit interview and he's like reading off the index cards, yeah. he's like, "Who do you think, think you are?" You, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, there's so many good office quotes. Um, I'm a big fan of Seinfeld, so a lot of just random Seinfeld stuff I'll spring in there. Uh, Serenity now, of course, being a, a, a top one. Leaving on a high note, George Costanza. You know, a lot of times because we're we're in like an office setting, so there's lots of opportunities to. You tell a really good joke, and you're like, "All right, I'm out of here. See you later." You know, um, and I give Drew a lot of hassle because he has not seen Seinfeld, and I think he would love it, but he just hasn't ever prioritized it. That's all. Yeah, okay. it just never never crossed him, my path. Give him a hard time about that, please, because he needs to see it. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> this is an obscure one from Seinfeld as well, but it's when, uh, Kramer has an idea to build levels in his apartment. He's like, has this revelation. He's like, I got this new idea to like completely change my apartment. He's like levels, Jerry. <laughs> I don't know why, but, um, you know, that's just really funny. So a lot of times when Rachel and I will just like randomly be like levels, Jerry, um, when we're trying to like over explain something that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and then of course, um, uh, oh shoot, there was another Seinfeld one that I just thought of that we say all the time and I can't remember. Oh yeah, all these big companies just write things off. There's so many opportunities to do that and then they're all talking write it about off. Kramer and they're like, what is a write-off? They're like, I don't know. That's just something people say. Obviously we run a company and there's lots of opportunities to say that. So we're talking about using pens or I'm like, oh, I really want that pen. He's like, oh, but these big companies just write things off. Anyway, um, nice. also like Drew said, big fan of 30 Rock. Um, I like a lot of obscure quotes from 30 rock that don't make any sense out of context but if you're a 30 rock fan um you know i love the dynamic between jack donaghy and um shoot will arnett's character what is his name drew i can't remember who's whose character will arnett what is he oh devin banks devin banks that's right so oh that's little... one thing i do too anytime i see martial arts it's karate <laughs> you know nice when he was practicing karate in the inappropriately short bathrobe. That's right. That's right. So they're having a little action, interaction and he's talking about how he, he's like, uh, it's like the best type of pizza, cold pizza or something like that. And Jack Donaghy's like, cold pizza better than hot pizza. What are you insane? And he goes, you don't tell me what kind of pizza to like. <laughs> <laughs> it's stuff like that where they're just like so specific and intense about something so unimportant. I absolutely love their, that. Their dynamic is marvelous. Oh my like, gosh. I would and love then, to see Will, Will Arnett and Alec Baldwin in a comedy together. Oh, that'd be so good. 
And then when Liz and Chris, this is towards the very end of the series, Drew, when Liz and Chris are having a little spat and she's talking about, uh, uh, they're, they're arguing about things that don't really matter. And, um, uh, she's talking about how he never closes the, the cardboard, uh, like flap on the cereal box. Yeah. Or right. Right. Like right. That. Yes. And, 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 and she, or maybe she didn't do it. I can't remember the context, but you know, she goes, <laughs> If you think that that cardboard flap is doing anything to seal in freshness, you are living in a fantasy world, pal. Right. <laughs> I love it. There was also another great late so season uh, or late series quote when uh, I think it was in an airport where some some lady behind a counter looks at um, Chris Chris and says, mm, you look like a baby. <laughs> and I just like, right. I wish I got more opportunities to use that one. But sadly, uh, I do not. That is it. That's a good one. Uh, oh, it's so such good. a good it's so a, such good. a good series. We could keep going for a while on this, but we we won't. We this was this was a. We will. Okay. Supposed I'll, to be end, a top I'll, end on, three. I'll end on one more because I got to throw. End a on a high note. No, I got. I, I will, but that, not that one. Um, I love Arrested Development too, and there's so many good quotable things out of that. Again, another Will Arnett. I guess I really like Will Arnett. Um, but uh, you know, his character Job uh, has a running theme throughout there. He says, "I've made a huge mistake," and uh, yes, that often comes up where we get to talk about that. Yeah, you office. and Sam say that a lot. Yes, yeah. Sam is a big uh, Arrested Development fan. We have a lot of inside jokes there. Yep. Um, it's always room for the banana stand. There's oh, just so many good ones. Yeah, M- Mr. F. Ah, oh, there's so many good things. Yep. Anyway, we make a lot of huge mistakes here at the Goulet Pen Company. <laughs> we really do. We really do. As is witness, why we shoot these videos. <laughs> oh right. Anyway, okay. Next, um, A S T hybrid or ass hybrid. I'm Astrid? not sure. I think it's Astrid. Astrid. A S T hybrid. Anyway. <laughs> They want us to talk about resin versus celluloid versus plastic, Brian. Ooh, the this, short answer mm, is it sounds it's da- all plastic. It sounds dangerously like a deep dive. Uh, yes, the short answer bait. is it's all plastic, just subcategories of plastic with different values, strengths, etc. If you want to skip to the next uh, question, you may now do so. Uh, well, you know, I thought what better way to start off with this answer than the, the definition of what makes something like plastic. Webster's defines <laughs> resin as... <laughs> Modern Webster's. Wikipedia <laughs> defines it as... So plastics are a wide range of synthetic or semi-synthetic materials that use polymers as a main ingredient. Their plasticity makes it possible for plastics to be molded, extruded, or pressed into solid objects of various shapes. So basically, it's a sen- semi-synthetic or synthetic material that can be molded into a shape. So it's a pretty broad category of things um the world's first fully synthetic plastic was bakelite invented in new york in 1907 by leo bakeland who coined the term plastics so it's not that old in the grand scheme of things a little over 100 years old this whole concept of plastics Um, and it's really interesting because when you're talking about pens there's very much a history and development of different plastics throughout the history of fountain pens because fountain pens came about in the mid to late 1800s. They were like wood and metal and ebonite, which is hard rubber, vulcanized rubber. And then as things like Bakelite and casein and these other modern plastics were literally being invented, they started putting them into fountain pens because the fountain pen was the communication tool of the day. It was like the iPhone of the early 1900s. So there's so much history intertwined with the historical development of different synthetic materials like plastics combined with like the industrial age and the scientific revolution of the early 1900s with chemistry and physics, you know, just like really exploding at that time. And fountain pens were really intertwined with all of that. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, there's a lot to explore there in terms of if you like to get into like fountain pen history and vintage stuff, we're not going to go there. I'm going to cut it off. And, uh, cause Drew's giving me the, the stare, like, <laughs> please don't. Um, but most pen plastics, I'm going to very much generalize. They fall into acrylics and celluloids. Resin is literally just a fancy buzzword term for plastic. It's just a nicer sounding word than plastic because plastic has a connotation of being used for like milk jugs and trash bags and things that like are very disposable. Technically it's different types of plastics and things like that. But when you just lump everything into one category together, it doesn't sound so great when you're talking about thousand dollar pens, right? So resins or precious resins or whatever type of spin you want to put on it, they're marketing e-buzzwordy terms. 
that can encompass pretty much anything in this general category of semi-synthetic moldable, you know, chemicals, right? So um, I would say most fall into either acrylics or, cellul acrylics or celluloids. Um, acrylic acetate is a very common pen material. Think about Edison pens, um, you know, anything that has like a kind of a quartz-like appearance to it is pretty much giveaway for acrylic acetate. Usually those are cast into sheets and turned down on a lathe out of rods. So they're a little more expensive, but they have some different properties to it. Um, injection molding is a common method for pen manufacturing. Injection molding, I tried to look and just research about like which plastics are typically used in injection molding. It's really tough because a lot of times in injection molding, because you're just the process you use for injection molding, you're heating it up, you're injecting it under high pressure into a mold. You have a lot of options. And a lot of times they are, um, you know, kind of like a bunch of things mixed together. So they will do blends of different types of plastics when they're doing an injection molding um, because they can do that. Um, so I don't really know exactly what type of plastic is typically injection molded in a pen. But when you think of injection molded plastic, you're typically thinking of slightly less expensive pens, you know, because they're more for mass production. The molds themselves are incredibly expensive. You're talking 50 to $150,000 to develop a single pen mold, not even talking the machines, not even talking any of the materials for the pen. So in order to cover that cost, you got to make a Bart ton of pens, just a whole huge bunch of them. You're talking into the hundreds and thousands, millions or billions of pens to justify that cost. But it's more mass production, it's gonna be less expensive because the plastic itself is actually relatively cheap. Um, another material that's used for injection molding that is a little more expensive and requires more polishing, stuff like that is uh, PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate. Um, that's used in a lot of high-end um, like plastic jewelry. So if you have like really nice like designer bracelets and earrings and stuff like that, that's almost always going to be PMMA. And so you will have, um, you know, pens, think about pens like the, um, I don't know 100% for a fact, but I believe like the Visconti Van Gogh, like that's the type of material you're getting to. It's a much higher, higher quality, um, much more durable resin plastic than your typical injection molding plastic. So that's a lot of time what's being used. I, I want to say that's what Pelican uses for their pens as well, is the PMMA. It's more durable, but it requires more polishing and stuff after the fact. So there's a lot more labor involved in doing it that way. Those are typically what you see in the injection molded stuff. And then um, the other one are celluloids. And there are a variety of different celluloids you get too. Noodler's pens are celluloid. They're like a cellulose butyrate. So it's technically a celluloid, but it's not the uber traditional, what you would consider to be celluloid, right? Um, so celluloid, we won't go too deep down that rabbit hole, but it's a much more, it's a more natural, like it's more of a, a blend. It's usually got like a cotton fiber component to it. Um, so the celluloid, it, it stands for cellulose. There's some kind of natural fibrous material that's combined in there with the resins. But the problem is it's very, very difficult to manufacture. It's very finicky. The natural element to it, the cellulosic aspect to it can cause it to uh, be flammable, especially in production. It can cause it to bend and warp over time, especially in like high heat. It can react with certain chemicals and things like that. So there are some downfalls to it, but it was, it was an earlier way of manufacturing plastics, these celluloid materials. Um, and traditionally you think about nitrocelluloid. That's the, that's the true celluloid you get with vintage pens. Almost no one makes nitrocelluloid anymore because it's so expensive, flammable. It's very, you have to store it a certain way in like a fireproof section of the warehouse. It's different from everywhere else. I mean, we've talked with uh, uh, Monograppa. They had a warehouse fire that they had a huge loss because they had a fire related to their celluloid material. And so they have all those things in place now for that, but they're not really manufacturing more of it. Um, the nitrocelluloid, the, um, mm. think about like, you know, the old bankers, like visors with the green, those were nitrocelluloid. The, um, old film, stock. film, film stock was nitrocelluloid and, uh, ping pong balls are actually like the dominant 
thing. So if you take a ping pong ball and light it on fire, that thing is going to go up in flames. It's pretty cool, actually. Um, but you didn't hear that from me. Don't if you're a minor or a child, please don't do that. Um, but you just look it up on YouTube. It's cool. Somebody's done it, but just don't do it yourself. Um, disclaimer, legal disclaimer, don't hurt yourself. This is not a recommendation, but um, that's actually, I believe, the single most uh, you know common use for nitrocelloid today is ping pong balls. So kind of fun. But anyway, bottom line is there's there's some things that can be gleaned from the type of plastic that might be used in a pen. However, because they are mostly synthetic, uh, often, you know, f very formulated, very proprietary things, it's kind of a protected thing, what blend might be used. So um, if there's a particular rare or interesting aspect to it that could maybe make it more expensive, for example, like the traditional, you know, nitrocelluloid, oftentimes a pen manufacturer will say this is like a true celluloid, right? Because it's going to be a lot more expensive. It's going to be harder to attain. Is it truly worth that much more of the cost? It's very debatable, probably not for most people. Um, but usually, unless you have some particularly interesting aspect of it, most pen manufacturers aren't even going to bother you telling you what kind of plastic that they're using for their pens. And frankly, does it matter? Like, because there's not that varying properties between the ones that are commonly used in fountain pens. A lot of it comes down to the design elements and the engineering aspects of the pen, not just the material itself that's used. So I don't think it's anything that you should lose any sleep over. But if you're kind of interested in the chemistry aspect of things, I can understand where you might be inclined to know more about it. But that's that's about that's about it. I feel like we went into the maybe the five foot end of the pool, maybe not the deep end, Drew, but enough where, you know, if you, if you're not a strong swimmer, you're not going to be able to touch the bottom as much <laughs> and you might get kind of uncomfortable. So we'll, we'll swim back to the shallow end and go to the next question. Nice. Oh man. All right. Let's go. Let's go a little easier on this one, Drew. Um, so, uh, noodlers and nude, I don't know. It got cut off, but that's what I got. Uh, pens with a high cuteness factor. <laughs> noodlers, I, that was the, he was trying to say the name of the person who asked this. Name of the person who asked it, but it's cut off. Noodlers and yes. nude. N O O D, um, not N U D E. Right, right. I just realized how that sounded now. Sorry. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, what are some cute pens, Drew? <laughs> cute pens. Well, the first one I talked about was, or the first one I thought about was the Twisby Go. We had recently talked about the Twisby Swipe, but the Go is a um, pretty, pretty, pretty fun looking pen. It's got, it's definitely not trying to win any awards for professionalism it definitely exudes a hey i'm going to be friends with you no matter how old you are sort of thing you know i can i can take a beating but we're still going to have some fun together you know but um so it's, it's very durable it, it doesn't look like a toy per se but it also kind of has the look of something that you can have fun with so um that one made my list i also obviously thought about the Jin Hao shark that has to be on there because it's of course, adorable of course especially the light blue and the pink ones those are just fun the coveco lilliput is so tiny it has to be on the cute list because it's just like a diminutive little tiny thing um Big punch, though. It's a solid pen for the size, but it's still cute. You could also put the Traveler's Pen in there if you want to, but the Lilliput is a smaller, more cute version of the Traveler's Pen. And I'll, I'll pipe in here, too. I would I would throw, like, most of the Quakos, like the sports and the classics yeah. and stuff like that. They, I think the Lilliput's a little cuter, you know, than yeah. that, but but any of them could fall into that category for they sure. They very much could, yeah, especially the, um, the newer ones, the Frost uh, Sports. Those have the tropical vibe going on. They're freaking adorable. Yeah. And then the Pilot Kakuno, those have smiley faces on the nibs, winky faces, smiley faces, little tongue. Um, they're you cannot beat those. It's obviously it's definitely the cutest nib for sure. And then finally, I put the Retro Fifty One Buzz Pen. I think that's adorable, and they have a cute little bear on the finial, and he's making just the cutest little bear face. I mean, come on. That one's pretty good. That one's pretty good. Yeah. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add. I got a couple that are kind of similar to those. I like the Traveler's Brass Pen, very similar to kind of the uh, Kaveco Lily put, uh, but I think that one's that one's pretty cute too. Um, and I put the Twisby Mini and the Vac Mini because I don't know, maybe it's because they oh, have yeah. they have yeah, bigger call. they have bigger versions of those pens specifically. So especially when you hold it up next to, it's yeah. like you know bigger bigger brother or sister whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think they they look pretty adorable. So they do. You're right. Those are good ones. Yeah, not as much like cutesy, but just like you know, especially when I hold it yeah. in my hand, it's like, are you kidding me? It's like this tiny little thing. Yeah. So yeah, very cool. Delightful. Right, all right, next up, David Drukey, which he has my first name and his last name. Hey, um. He asks the simple question, 
how ink is made. Technically, he didn't ask this. He just wrote how ink is made. That's true. With no punctuation. But David, we, we hear you. We, we're picking up your body. <laughs> we got your buddy. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a mystery, isn't it, Brian? Um, a little bit. Yeah, this kind of falls into the same thing like with what, what kind of plastic is your pen made out of. It's usually proprietary and it's usually some kind of formulation. Honestly, with ink too, you know, from talking to different manufacturers, um, it varies a lot from one ink color to another even. It's not even like, yeah, just, you know, take some dye and throw it in the water and you've got ink. I mean, yes, you can do that. You can take you know, wine and like water it down and put it in your pen. I know people have done that with dip pens. I know people that make right with coffee and tea and food coloring and water. And like, yes, technically these things could be considered ink. But if we're talking about like actual, like commercially made fountain pen ink, it's a little more involved than that. Um, with a lot of caveats that it's all kind of specialized. You get into, I don't know, most of the ink makers I imagine are like over a cauldron, you know, kind of brewing up formulas with like eye of newt and stuff like that. Uh, you know, toad hairs and whatever. I don't know. Um, I don't even know what that means, but it's, it's a bit mysterious. I agree. Um, but the main components of most fountain pen ink, um, the biggest one is going to be water, distilled water. So just pure water with no minerals in it whatsoever. Um, some kind of dye, right. That can vary a lot depending on what it is, but a dye or a combination of dyes. Um, you're going to have usually some kind of biocide, so something to keep stuff from growing in your ink. Um, you're going to have uh, a surfactant in it, so some type of glycerin, uh, some type of soapy type thing to help with lubrication, to help the ink keep flowing through the pen and help, uh, you know, just keep everything uh, moving along. And then you will have salt is the other component in there. And that uh, helps keep everything in suspension and keeps it so that stuff doesn't separate out quite as much. I believe that's the, what the component is there. Um, and so you get all those combinations in there, some varying degrees. There may be some other stuff, especially if you have, you know, like iron gall ink, or you have a pigmented permanent ink, a shimmering ink. So there can be other stuff that might oh, yeah. be in the ink beyond that, you know, other fun things. If there's wild properties or you get into, you know, some really interesting, you know, characteristics with ink, it might deviate from those a little bit, but generally speaking with your traditional fountain pen inks, it's going to contain some degree of those five components. Yeah. Fun fact, um, Jacques Urban inks do not have biocide in them. That is correct. They moved away from biocide and they went au natural uh, years ago. Um, so that is phenol, phenol was commonly used as a biocide for a long time in the pen world, but it um, is known to be a carcinogen. So they no longer use phenol in most fountain banks that I'm aware of. There's some other biocides and stuff. But anyway, so if you're using a really old vintage ink, just keep in mind, it's probably got phenol in it. That's part of why it might smell kind of funny. Yeah. Uh, when you visited Noodler's Ink Company, a.k.a. Nathan's house, yes. did you get to see his cauldron um, and, his, and his, uh, his toad hair and all that? I got to see some... I got to see a lot of things. What, was, were these things proprietary? You can't talk about them? It was definitely proprietary. I was, okay. I was certainly not... It was, I was asked not to, and I certainly did not take any pictures or anything like okay. that out of respect. He didn't say specifically, like, don't tell anybody what you saw here. Uh, most of it, I had no idea what the heck I was looking at because it essentially <laughs> looked like it was kind of like a Rube Goldberg type setup. I mean, it was... That's good. That's kind of what I was picturing. I'm kind of glad that you said that because yeah. I, don't, I, I enjoyed that mental image. Well, and you know, Nathan, Nathan just fundamentally is a very... Um, he's very frugal. And he is very, what's the word I'm looking for? He's very um, resourceful. Tell me, please tell me he had animals powering some sort of machine. Uh, I didn't see any animals powering anything. Dang it. Um, but he definitely. I just, like, want to, I would just want a raccoon on a wheel, like creating like some sort of Tesla-esque coil situation no I, b I believe ever almost everything in his process except for the printing of his ink labels was 100 percent manual i believe he just does everything manually himself wow um so there was a lot of containers there were a lot of like boxes and things there yeah. were a lot of like tubes running places so that's you know. the closest you've ever gotten to actually seeing ink being manufactured right like you've well, never been to an actual so ink been factory to, have you i went to lami's facility where they i didn't see them manufacturing the ink right but i did you saw get them to bottling see it and everything bottling it and putting it in cartridges yeah. so i got to see that part of the process 
Um, I've been to other places like Yaffa, you know, where they have Monteverde Inc. And um, now Private Reserve is there as well, though I didn't, I haven't been there since they started doing Private Reserve. They're not manufacturing the ink and its raw components there. Um, I have never visited a place other than Nathan's, I guess, where the ink is actually made yeah. itself. But it's my understanding that most fountain pen ink, especially the boutique inks, the smaller ones, um, it's a relatively home brewed kind of process. Um, mm -hmm. Think about literally if you're doing like micro brewing, you know, for making like beer or something like that or, or moonshine or whatever, it's, you're, it's pretty, you're not buying like big industrial equipment. You're like kind of cobbling together stuff to mix and make it happen and heat it up at certain points and all that. It's pretty much like that at, mm -hmm. I believe most fountain pen ink makers, maybe at a place like Pilot, where, you know, Pilot started out more making ink and they do, they do ink like a big scale for, you know, textiles and stuff like that over in Japan. So I imagine their process is going to be much more industrial, um, though I have no idea what that looks like there. I imagine it's more like, kind of like if you go to a place where they're like manufacturing a lot of like food or like drink items, it'll just be large, like vats of stainless steel things with tubes yeah. running everywhere and bottles going down a conveyor kind of thing. That's probably more what you have at a larger place like that. But, you know, if you think about how much fountain pen ink, like if you, if you mix a vat, I mean, think about anything else, like think about soda, like how much soda gets drunk in this world, like the scale at which you're manufacturing that stuff versus fountain pen ink. Like you could probably take like one container that they would make soda in and that would be enough fountain pen ink for the entire world for a year like just one container in one day you know it's just it's generally such a such a smaller scale production you know you're not going to have like anything too crazy in terms of uh what it actually looks like to make it in fact i believe from talking to people who i know have like started ink making from scratch like uh, organic studios right like he was a college student you know tyler was a excuse me a college student when he started making that ink I mean, he was telling me in his early days, he was like boiling it up on a pot on his stove and then like filtering it and like literally like making it in his kitchen. So I think that's super cool in terms of like, you know, the grassroots, like homegrown, start your own business kind of thing. But I think there's like a heavy component of like mad scientistness going on in the fountain pen ink world uh, until you get to a certain level where you're just like making massive, massive quantities of it. So... Yeah, that's as far as I know. But I, if I do ever get the chance to like tour a facility where they're actually making ink, if they would ever let us see that, I don't know. Probably not because it's so proprietary. Um, but that would be pretty cool. I'll keep that on my radar for sure. Very cool. Well, thank mm -hmm. you for taking us through that. That's interesting. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Drew, in advance for taking us through this hypothetical, which hey! is about to happen right now. There we go. Now, I might have sometime in the past asked you this one before brian but um i've forgotten it already i promise yeah i don't remember your answer so the question is if you could have a tree in your backyard that produced any food item you would like at infinitum what would it be and no you cannot sell it or monetize it in any way it cannot leave your home you cannot feed the world with it. it has, I was going to say, you got to get, you got to get some know, parameters I know. here. Oh, I know. I'm ready. You cannot, um, you can invite people over for dinner and feed this to them. You can cook with it, uh, but uh, you cannot monetize it or distribute it. So I couldn't just say like, mass. like black truffles. I would just want it to grow black truffles and then I would just no. sell them on the market, you know, to no. morel mushrooms. Yeah. No. <laughs> Okay, so now I, it could it could be it could be like a prepared dish. Like if you wanted a pizza tree, you could have you ooh. know you could have like you know pizzas on the tree. Would they have to all be the same pizza, or could it like vary it up a little? Like different types of pizza could grow on the tree, and um, I've never seen a tree that grew different types of the same thing. So I'm gonna go with no. So it's got to be like a specific type of thing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. I can't sell it. Can I give it away? No, it cannot leave your home. Can't leave my home. Like, but my family could eat it, right? Not yes. just me. Yes. Okay. So a tree in my yard for f consumption for my immediate family. Yes. And it would be hot and ready to go. You know, it would start mm. cooling the second you clipped it off the branch. And no, no animals would be getting to it either. So you don't need to worry about. Oh, because that is, that is a legit concern of mine because. Oh yeah. They wouldn't I, even know. They wouldn't even know it's there. Okay. So I would have protection against the animals. 
that yep. take over my property. It would be an indestructible tree. It wouldn't get wet with the weather or anything like that. It'd be, okay. It's a pretty, pretty confined immune ecosystem. I got a couple of different ideas. Do I have to nail down just one or can I, let me talk it out loud and then I'll settle on something. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, one thing I'll say is my kids literally never get sick of eating hot dogs. Um, so nice. that would be a super convenient, but hot dogs are so easy to kind of make happen anyway. They are. I wouldn't worry about that. I've, they, I've been, I've been in meetings with Brian and Rachel before remotely and heard them like telling the kids, yes, you can have a hot dog in yes, the background. You, fine. You can have another hot dog. <laughs> It's real. Or like, he's, didn't you just have a hot? Didn't you have a? Hot, did you have a hot dog for breakfast? He's like, not kidding about this. That, that's uh, those are some hot dog eating kids. Yeah, they're convenient. <laughs> they're convenience over quality for sure. Um, we try to at least buy the healthiest hot dogs we can. But you know, Tonight, it's COVID life, to, right? We're trying hard here. Oh yeah, no, no, no. Don't don't tell me this. this I bought hot dogs for this week, and then because um, Shannon does uh, community theater, so she's doing rehearsals right now. So it's like dad cooking weeks, and uh, tonight I'm making hot dog burgers for the first time where i'm gonna smush burger meat into the shape of a hot dog grill them put them put them in a hot dog bun um with like lettuce and tomatoes and cheese oh wow yes archer is very excited about that that's pretty fun i've never gone to that degree but i've definitely cooked burgers and we've not had burger buns and we've had leftover hot dog buns and i've just like slice up the burger and stuck it in a hot dog bun and the kids think it's kids think it's so fun and i'm like great because i'm lazy anyway (laughs) um it's always nice when you can create a win-win um yeah hot dog tree is a contender bacon tree that would be pretty good contender but that's so narrow i feel like i'd get sick of that pizza tree pizza tree is a good contender it's hard to hate Mm -hmm. pizza Mm -hmm. hard to hate pizza is it sound okay does it sound really weird that like I love apples. Like my kids love apples. I knew but I you like were gonna at least. I, so I knew you. I knew you were gonna bring that. up. I knew you were gonna bring that up. But I, yes. I think I think I know what to choose. I would choose a chipotle burrito tree. Oh, very because nice. you get a good mix. You get a good mix of foods in there. Mm-hmm. Some vegetables, some meat. You know, dairy grains, all kinds of stuff. It's like mm-hmm. nice kind of rounded out meal. Yeah. You know. And you've eaten Chipotle enough to know that you're not gonna get sick of it because you'd be sick of it by now. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 The other contender would be like a Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich tree. That would be a, that that's right up there with the hot dog tree, but you can't really make those on your own. So yeah, fair but enough. Good call. That'd, that'd be more for the case. So right. yeah, Chipotle I, yeah. burrito tree, I think would be where I would settle on. Yeah. Good call. Good yeah. call. My, mine would be a uh, jambalaya tree. Just some sort of like how does bag. Ju- how does jambalaya so, grow on a tree? <laughs> well, I feel like it would come in some sort of organic bag that you'd click, you'd clip off and then just like kind of dump it on a plate. Yeah. Or that's, like a, that. Or like a coconut where you crack it open and there's hot yeah, jambalaya yeah. on the inside. I just, it, j- jambalaya is just so expensive to make because I like a lot of stuff in it. Like I want mm. shrimp and chicken and andouille. Like I want all the meats in there. That's and, a pretty good one. That's pretty good. And it's also like a lot of the, it all cooks at different rates too. Like the shrimp cooks super fast. So you have to do all this stuff separately. So yeah, jambalaya. That's a pretty good one. Yeah. That's cool. Pretty good all right. I would have thought you might have said shrimp and grits, Drew, because I know you're a big fan of that. But jambalaya uh, I, is in that, yes. it's in that ballpark though. Yeah, no, I'm I'm a big fan of the uh, shrimp and grits at that one particular restaurant for sure. Is it really just there? Food for thought. I mean, well, since I've gotten that shrimp and grits, every other shrimp and grits has become <laughs> has been subpar. In, it's it's inferior. There's no point. <laughs> oh, yeah, wow. so it's it's ruined shrimp and grits for me. It's like, why would I buy it from you? You are not the right there one. There you go. There is yeah. only one shrimp and grits now. I can answer that question for Rachel too. She would choose a crab cake tree. She loves crab cakes and not uh, <laughs> not nachos. Um, no, read no crab cakes would be, okay. I think, more her vibe. She likes okay. nachos, but you know, it's not something that she's wanting to eat all the time as we're pushing into our 40s here. We're trying to be a little better, but not that crab cakes are super uber Meanwhile, healthy. Meanwhile, anyway, one of us had nachos for dinner last night. Is that so? so? <laughs> yeah, well, Archer had this, they did this thing at school where they keep the kid for the evening to allow the parents to have like a date night or something like that. And he wanted to go because it's movies and they brought the game truck. So he gets to play like, you know, games. And truck. But Shannon's at rehearsals. So I'm just at home. I'm like, OK, sure. You can go do that thing. I'm just going to be by myself. So I'm like, just kind of pacing around. Up. You know, it nice. Kind of worse. It was either that or like ramen or something like that. I could have made something <sighs> for myself, but eh. <laughs> I had just, but was, they were stupid nachos, Brian. All we had were the scoops and they're not, they're, they're not ideal for melting cheese over. They just... 
they're they're i need oh you can't need, use scoops are a dipping chip they are not i know they're not it was a nacho all we chip. had it was all we had oh I, I was not hot happy with now burger hot dog tonight that's going to be good so I'm, I'm looking forward to that that's cool i'm yeah. a big I'm, right. a big I'm a big fan of taking foods and making them into the shapes of other foods in an unconventional oh, way yeah i find that very interesting for sure Sure. Like corn, my, like my, corn, corn my, dogs. Uh, corn dogs are very interesting to me. I'm a big fan. Corn of dogs this. Are very, Do you yeah. like the Do you like the breakfast corn dogs that have like the pancake with the, wrapped around the sausage? I can't say I've ever really had those. Well, they have them at the frozen section of your grocery store. I might have to try those. That my kids would probably freaking love that. A they're lot of people think they're, they 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 taste, they taste essentially like a McGriddle. They're just one of the most American things in existence. I feel. I mean, a yeah. hot dog wrapped in a pan a pancake. Hot dog wrapped in a pancake. Yeah, that's that's well, it's, it's, well, it's 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 a it's a it's sausage wrapped in a pancake on a stick. Oh, sausage. Oh, yes, it's. Oh, OK. Yeah, I could see. I would be into that. I don't it's hate the, of, I don't hate the McGriddle. Yeah, neither do I. I wish I did, but I don't. Well, you, other, you like a lot of food that I don't. I know. Why you, why I know. Like so I love much. I love bad food. <laughs> um, another my, my second choice would be seared steak tree because Ooh. I, I miss my my old grill had a side burner so I could mm. like sear steaks on the cast iron skillet on nice. that and not stink up the house because you you put you cook you cook steak on a skillet in the in the yeah, kitchen it's and it, it's, it's got it's it's got a funk on it so yeah, do you use a, do you use that. a cast iron pan Drew at home yes cast iron, cast iron um, yeah. seared on both sides and you dip and then you throw in whole cloves of garlic a ton of butter and then a lot of thyme and sometimes some rosemary and Ooh. then you cook it on both sides just enough and then you tilt it to one side and just pour the butter over the steak over and over and over and over again and I'm it is so hungry right now <laughs> oh my god it's so, <laughs> it's so delicious all right oh, let's move man. on to uh what's happening What's happening? Well, Drew, what's just, happening? the big what's happening is you just went to the DC Pen Show, my friend. I did. That's the big event. I, I would, did. It was I, fun. I would it love to fun. hear about it because I did not go. It was the first one in 12 years that actually happened that I <sighs> well, missed, I will, unfor- unfortunately, due to personal conflict. But I, I will I will say um, it was it was busy. It was definitely busy. There yeah. were a lot of people there. I got there and the line was, you know, out into kind of the main hallway. But later... Yeah. I it saw pictures got out. of it like it was in the parking deck I yes, saw it was yes, like it got it got all the way out to the parking deck so wow. I, I thought it would be pretty busy cuz Raleigh a pretty small show was busy so yeah DC was pretty crazy at least wow. it was on Saturday anyway I heard it was much less busy on Friday but I only went on Saturday so mm. um but I got to see a lot of fun people a lot of people that I knew and was excited to see a lot of people that I had never met before but I was excited to see so that was really enjoyable. Got to see a lot of our vendors, friends that we hadn't seen in a very long time because of COVID. Speaking of COVID, everybody had to wear masks. So that was nice to see uh, when they or we were at the bar slash little cafe area. It took them off while you were sitting and, you know, doing that. But on it, in the show zone, masks 100%. So that, that was good. Happy to see that. Maybe okay. feel a little less funky, but there are still some, you know, places to go and hide if you're feeling a little anxious, you know, especially downstairs where all the conference I mean, rooms are. That's usually such an overwhelming show anyway, because it's the big yeah. one. It's like that's the biggest one in the country. It is. Oh. You know that little room that's always really, really cramped? That oh, one yeah. was actually surprisingly less cramped because okay. I think they had some people pull out or something. That one's that yeah. one, not not as claustrophobic. And they didn't have Chatterley right next to Canalea like they have had in years past. Oh, that so was like right at the entrance. And it right. Was just like yeah, it created a crazy, crazy bottleneck that uh, was yeah. always bad news because yeah. those are two very attractive tables. Yes. Um. So really great energy. Everybody was just so, so happy to be there. I mean, if you've ever interacted with any element, even a local pen meetup, the Fountain Pen community is such a cheerful, positive, welcoming crowd. And Get, you, when you're in it on mass, like you just feel that just joy. Everybody was just happy to be there, happy to see yeah. literally everybody. Just a really nice energy. Especially right now, I have to imagine like a lot of people have not been traveling, have not been seeing each other. Like I can just imagine that the vibe was very, very strong in that way. I'm sorry to miss yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I was sad that um, we've gone uh, the you know local Goulet company and anybody from our team that had visited traditionally has gone to a Mexican restaurant in years past, kind of like taken a midday break yes. and gone to this restaurant called Cyclone Anaya's in the Mosaic District in That's right. um, northern Northern Virginia, and. It shut down, and I was super <sighs> bummed out by that because 
They had the best years, pancakes. They did have the best pancakes. A couple of years ago, I was there with Brian, Rachel, and a couple other members of the team here, and I saw at this Tex-Mex place, they had pancakes on the menu. I'm like, there's it's not a breakfast menu. This, it wasn't even in a breakfast section. I'm like, why are pancakes here? It was literally must- just under there, like with like refried beans, pancakes. You know, I'm like, like, well, I need, I need to get these pancakes. Obviously, they're here for a reason. Oh yeah, somebody Drew, back there is good at making some damn pancakes, so I'm going to be getting some. So Drew, Drew anyway. like, got really excited, and he, you, I, I can't remember. Were you the only one? Because yes. we went there twice. You were yes. the only one that first year. I was, and, then and I they were say, amazing. I want to say the next year that we went, like half the table got the pancakes. Yes, because <laughs> I told them, and they recognized <laughs> the pancakes. Drew, you're a micro influencer for Cyclone and I have pancakes. <laughs> micro, micro, micro. Though apparently it didn't work because now they're no, business, but, it didn't. Oh well. If they would have just leaned into those pancakes and not so much into the other random food they sell, they would have been fine. But <laughs> so anyway. Food. Random food on theme with the. I was pretty. I was pretty bummed restaurant. about that, but um, luckily, um, uh, my friend Brian Chu, who is uh, who makes some um, Red Dragon pens, um, he's a you know independent maker. He just showed up while I was talking to Galen and was like, "Hey, you want a poke bowl?" I'm like, "What? What's what's a? I don't I don't know. I don't really know what those are." But he's just got a bag with like bunches of like raw salmon and rice and stuff. I'm like, "Oh uh, yeah, sure. I means I don't need to go out." So. I go and I eat uh, lunch with him and Mark Bacchus and, um, uh, you know, a bunch of other um, pen, you know, addict slack people. And that was fun. And later the next day, I was talking to Matthew Morse. Hey, Matthew. And he said the previous day on Friday, um, Brian came up and kind of did the same thing to him. So Brian Chu has this like, I have food. Would you like it sort of vibe at, at the show? And I thought that was just really hilarious because wow. Matthew basically gave the same story. Like, oh, yeah, he, he brought me food the previous day. <laughs> so wow. and he makes a lot of this, too. It's just like it, it's such a great community. You've got Sandra who brings like cookies and, you know, cupcakes all the time. Everybody just has kind of their thing. And you kind of get to know everybody and know their superpowers. And uh, it's just a yeah. Really great dynamic, wonderful, and wonderful I would, community. I would definitely say there's like, you know, plenty of people that go in there, it's their first show or they kind of live in the area. But I think there's like a hardcore element of people that like go to a lot of different pen shows. Like that is what they do like for their vacations. So you get people that like know each other. They see each other several times a year. There's definitely like a whole kind of like, you know, I don't know, call it inner circle or just like a tight, you know, group of people that like go to all the pen shows and that's that's really cool, and you're kind of becoming one of those people, Drew. I don't know. You've uh... well, I mean, if you if you go to enough of them, you you start to make it friends. Happens. And, and yeah. that's well, that's that's just that, that's one of the great things about fountain pens is you can just have that one thing in common. Even if you're an introvert, you just immediately have a connection with these people, and you'll immediately find that you have other interests outside of fountain pens because there mm-hmm. are a lot of these you know Venn diagram um, connections that you can make as well. So oh, it's yeah. just a really really great environment to be in. Um, so if you are a fan of fountain pens and you've never met anybody else that likes fountain pens as much as you try to find a place nearby um you know ideally when you know delta variant is no longer a thing but either way it is a great community to be in i'm really glad to be a part of it in the way that i am and um it's just a great way for like-minded people who share the same passion to connect with others so yay for that awesome do you have anything else, any other questions about the show specifically? I think that, I mean, that's the, that's the big, the big parts. No. Yeah. I was just kind of curious, especially with COVID impacts. And I know that, uh, you know, the show, for those that don't know, um, uh, Bob Johnson was a previous coordinator of the show. He founded it two decades ago, um, maybe 20, 25 years ago, something like that for a long time ago. Um, he ended up passing away last year, kind of during all the COVID stuff, um, unfortunately. And so this was the first show uh, after his passing. So it's, uh, now his sister and nephew are carrying on the tradition. So it was, you know, I was kind of curious if there was any, you know, Bob element to it. I know private reserve did a, you know, ink in his kind of honor. Um, you know, a lot of the vendors and stuff were pretty tight. They've been going to there for decades and they knew Bob and stuff like that. So, you know, I was curious. Yeah, if that, that, that was, that was the main thing was the, uh, memorial mm-hmm. ink. I gotcha. Suppose. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, yeah, well, I'm glad you had a good time. That was really cool. Yeah, it was fantastic. It really was. It was well worth the trip. Awesome. Uh, the drive person, back was like four hours. That was uh, a nightmare. Getting yeah. there was like an hour and a half. Really nice drive there. It was like, I made great time getting there. Getting when did you, when did you come back? Did you come back on uh, sun, Sunday? Yeah, Sunday morning. Oh, okay. You probably yeah, got yeah. like a lot of beach traffic and stuff like that. That's I probably have no what it idea. Is. It was a nightmare. 
Yeah, well, you know, when things start opening back up and people are going places, you get all that DC traffic again. It's pretty fun. Um, yeah, uh, me personally, I, I missed out. Um, you know, I was out for some personal reasons, um, but uh, I did get to do some of the things, you know, that I've been looking to do. So, uh, you know, Drew, I mentioned how we had like the Connects roller coaster and I wanted to build some of the alternate kits for some Lego Technic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, some of these kits I've had for years and I've never yeah. built the alternate kits. Last so, podcast, yeah. you had built an alternate to your crane. Absolutely. Finished that. <clears throat> yep. We were working on that on vacation a few weeks ago. Um, I did a hovercraft that was an alternate kit of a cargo plane that we had. Oh yeah. You mentioned that. Yeah. And I built like three or four other alternate kits because some of them, nice. are, some of them are not huge, you know, even if it's a smaller kit, you know, huh. 800 pieces or so, it takes you an hour and a half, two hours maybe. So I'll like, you know, take the old kit apart, which is kind of fun. And then, you know, I'll like work with Joseph. So it's like something that he and I are kind of doing together, which is pretty fun. Um, and I'm doing the classic, you know, parent thing, which is like, I'm, sorting through and finding the pieces for him and then he's building them kind of thing. Um, but it kind of works out well because, you know, we get to do it together and, you know, the build happens a little faster, you know, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. So that's been cool. Just getting to spend some good Lego time with Joseph. Um, and then the other thing I alluded to last time, which I showed the uh, Rubik's Cube little mosaic thing. Yeah. Uh, so I actually did complete that. The YouTube one was, the play button was actually fairly easy because there were a lot of them that were just completely solid and didn't even need to be changed, you know, because it was just red and white and you just turn the cube to the red side and that was it. Um, so I did that one. I will have the picture there. Uh, and so as soon as I did that, I showed it to the kids and they were like, oh, Joseph was like, can you make a Goomba? And I was like, what, like a Mario Goomba? Like, so yeah, I pulled up a picture and found... You know, I, you just look at pixel art. I mean, Drew, you know pixel art. So I just like literally, yeah, you got it right behind you. <laughs> so literally I was like Googling pixel art and um, they have websites for you, Rubik's Cube Mosaic. So you can take an image, you can upload it. It'll give you the breakdown with all the grid and everything. And I was like, well, this is cool. So I did not only the Super Mario Goomba, uh, but then I did uh, Goulet Ink Splatter as well. So I took pictures of all those and I'll show them here. But uh, yeah, just been having fun. These are little mini Rubik's Cubes. Um, so nice. You know, they're, they're, they're not too huge. If you use full size cubes, it's, it adds up price wise. And also it uh, you know, gets to be a little bit much in terms of storage. Uh, but I'm having an absolute blast and I'm trying to find some like loose justification for getting like a thousand cubes and creating some huge art project at the office or something. But <laughs> I would love to just like have a bunch of cubes, mess around with them and then like pass them on. I really can't justify spending like a thousand dollars on cubes and then you have to store all of them somewhere. I'm like, yeah, this isn't the most practical thing, but it's it, a seems, like the, it seems like the type of thing that would be on the wall at like a uh, red robin. So maybe you can donate them. Absolutely. I need like some <laughs> sort of. Well, I, jo I joke. I'm like, I need some sort of corporate sponsorship. I'm like, wait a minute. I have to run a company. Can I like sponsor it? That's what I'm trying to like. Just loosely, write it off. All these companies, Jerry, they just write things off. The perfect example. Seinfeld quote. Um, but yeah, so anyway, just having, having fun messing around with that. Um, so just again, we've been home with our kids for like a year and a half and it's summertime. So they literally have like no responsibilities whatsoever other than to be kept alive. So um, doing that, just trying to come up with fun projects to do with the kids. And also that's like fun for myself because, you know, Drew, things can get stressful sometimes as an adult. And when you're dealing with things, it's nice to have little things like that that just allow you to pretty much escape everything else in the world and get to do fun stuff with with your little ones. So, yes. Yeah. And honestly, uh, having kids gives you ideas, especially if you're s somebody that's obsessive like you and I and many, many fountain pen people are. Oh, yeah. Um, all we need is one little thing to send us down the rabbit hole. Yeah. And like the pen thing, I love that. But like my kids, you know, they don't, the uh, fountain pens are nuanced, right? Like, so like my kids love drawing and doing that kind of stuff, but like they don't geek out about all the details of the pens like, like I do. So I get them into it a little bit, but it's not a passion that can be quite as easily shared, but yeah, Legos and Rubik's cubes and, you know, video games. Yeah. They're on board with that. <laughs> Nice. Um, cool. So let's move on to some Compne updates. Not a whole, not a whole ton here. And again, I was out last week, so um, I'm still kind of getting up to speed as we're filming this. But um, the biggest thing I think for us, you know, you notice we're shooting remotely today. Um, just the COVID-19 safety protocol stuff. You know, basically, if you look at the curve, especially we look at Virginia Department of Health, we look at um, you know our governor, we look at CDC and uh, you know, try to make intelligent decisions based on what we know about how to operate safely in our building and in our environment with 
anybody that would come to our building. Um, so we, we always try to exercise an abundance of caution, you know, and so we are, um, you know, kind of, I guess, kind of swinging the pendulum back a little bit because things were looking so good over the summer. And now it's like the Delta variants, really, it's kind of a different animal. And we are really learning more about that and, you know, having to exercise a lot of cautiousness again, things are unfolding constantly in the last couple of weeks really have changed a lot of things. So trying to be very intelligent. Also, we've got school that's going to be starting up within the next month. So all the anxieties of parenthood are kicking in. Joseph is going to be starting middle school, which is kind of blowing my mind. So all of these things fold into, you know, some kind of stressful thing. So we're just trying to keep a close eye on all those updates. And it's just pretty evident that this roller coaster is not over, unfortunately. And uh, we're just going to have to keep adapting, you know, week to week with how things go uh, with COVID life. So, but overall, we got a good team. We're keeping things very solid. You know, our suppliers are dealing with things. It's pretty much like whack-a-mole in terms of stock outages or shipping delays or whatever. Um, we're kind of in a constant, you know, state of having to, you know, bob and weave a little bit depending on what's going on. And I think we're just going to keep seeing that for quite some time. So, uh, that's pretty much what we got going on at the company. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes with video production and things like that as we're trying to distance and do all the safe things. But, you know, we're motivated. We're going to try to keep doing stuff. We'll so do something. You, you're going to have a hard time shutting us up. So we're going to keep it coming. But yeah, we'll do something <laughs> for sure. Awesome. All right, what's on your desk, Drew? What are you playing with What's right now? on my desk? Brian, we got a gift from our friend across the pond over in the United Kingdom, Graham, okay. who helped us with the question about the converter compatibility on some of the MRs and other things. Yeah, thank you, Graham. Graham sent us this. What is that? I can't this tell. This is a pilot Pluminix. Pluminix. Plumini. Not Plumix. Not. It's got, it's got mini in the title, Brian. Plumini. Get it? X. That's clever. It's got mini. Plumini. X. Nice. It's a tiny Plumix. So is this like a it's, miniature Plumix? It is exactly a miniature Plumix. That's cool because the Plumix is kind of long. It's kind of like, it's an awkward size. A bit unruly. Yeah, I mean, it's meant to be so, more of like a script pen, a desk pen, but does that one feel more like a conventional fountain pen size or is it truly no, like a mini it, pen? It feels it feels like a mini. feels mini? Because a postable, yeah, I mean, like the Plumix? Yeah, <laughs> yeah but the like postable barely, doesn't... It doesn't do much. I mean, <laughs> what's the point of that? Yeah. But it takes a standard international size cartridge. Interesting. Yeah, look at that thing. Hey, look at that. See, we've so, never seen this in the U.S. This is not something that we have access to. No, it is not something we have access to. But Graham said in his letter that he owns one of these that takes a pilot-sized um, uh, cartridge or converter. So <clears throat> like we said a couple well, of weeks ago, they're really all over the place. You, you can get them uh, you know, any which way if you try yeah. hard enough. But I thought this was <clears throat> fun. And honestly, we could go back to the cute pen list and maybe put this one on there, but um, oh. it's not available in the U.S., so we will not be able to carry it. If you're in the U.S., you're going to have a hard time getting it, but it's the internet. You can find anything if you try hard enough. So anyway, that's all on my desk. And cool. since we use this opportunity to also talk about just kind of like how we are using our pens, I figured I would also mention the fact that I uh, added a um, section in my uh, little journal here for um, my office plants, plant uh, watering schedule, because I am, I think, killing another succulent. Um, t <laughs> TBD on that one. But I just, I know that you have killed many a succulent as well, Brian. And I I'm, I'm, I'm choosing everyone, to, every one of them I've ever had, I've killed. Yeah, I'm mainly to due some... to neglect and forgetfulness altogether. Not because I've like yeah. really tried to care for them and failed. It's more like I end up moving it behind something on my desk and it gets covered with clutter and I uncover it three months later and I'm like, oh, <laughs> forgot about that thing. Now it's like a shriveled husk, like a <laughs> like one of Ursula's, you know, prisoners yes, and little mermaid. Poor unfortunate that's soul. How, that's how they I have yeah, all my uh, all my succulents are poor unfortunate souls. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this thing's not looking too happy, and I think it might have been overwatered, which is usually how I kill them. Um, but yet, I also thought it, but they're getting wrinkly and not happy looking. So uh, this one is probably, it might be, but I have this adorable um, Spaceship Earth planter. 
because I'm a Disney nerd, but yeah, I need to start keeping track. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep track of when I water them and, you know, not go too long because some of these can be watered like once every couple weeks or maybe once a month really and be just fine. And I need to just, I always think that it's been too long and it how do really you like, never has. How do you bring it back? That's what I don't know. Like with a succulent, they're so low maintenance when it starts to die. I'm always, I'm well, always when, like, if I do anything, is it going to be too much? You know, if it's, if it's not been watered, water can bring it back, but it's been over water. You pretty much need to just like, like pray to the plant. Chill gods. out, chill out, stop yeah. watering it. <laughs> now this one, I've, this one ha has been going strong for years. And now by going strong, I mean, hasn't died, not going strong, mm. but, uh, yeah, it's not looking great these days. It's got this one little tiny leaf here that it was able to manage, but it just, it stopped. And now it's just a little deformed, tiny leaf. So, oh gosh, uh, I'm not great at it, but I'm choosing to have discipline. I'm going to, going to do it. Okay. You'll have to follow up with us on, with us on that and let's, let us know how it goes. We'll do. All right. What about you? What's, 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 uh, on your desk? Oh gosh, my place is a mess. I just got to get things cleaned up. So All right. I don't have anything super specific. I actually probably have things at the office that I need to pick up. Um, uh, no. actually we got the carpet cleaned recently and the oh. people that did that here at the office decided to put pretty much everything that was on your floor on top of your desk. So, uh, yeah, you've got a lot of stuff on your desk right now. I have a lot of stuff on my desk. <laughs> yeah. So my, <laughs> my, my office ends up being, so we get random samples, we get things, you know, it's like a variation change or something. And it's, you know, it's kind of like, what do we do with this random one-off thing? It's like, well, well, I'll just take it, you know, and so all this stuff ends up collecting in my office and over a few years that uh, can get out of hand. So I have like bins and bins and bins of all yeah, kinds of I came into of my office and noticed, yeah, I noticed that they had put my trash thing and my recycling thing up on a chair. I'm like, oh, what happened? And then okay. I walked into your office. I was like, oh, they took everything off the floor. Well, so. technically we did that. They asked us to move everything. Oh, in. you did that? Yeah, Jen did, okay. Jen did that. Yeah, because oh, I didn't do the recycle. But oh, okay, gotcha. So okay. You, probably a couple of people went around the office and just picked up gotcha. the stuff to. They I was may, out. They may have moved late. the trash cans because they they do take out our trash. But I gotcha. think yeah, the cleaning oh, okay. crew they. Uh, yeah, they don't touch it. They don't like to touch our personal effects for liability reasons. But you know, super boring gotcha. business stuff. But anyway, um, there you go. Now we have cleaner carpets. Hooray! <laughs> yeah. So my life at home, I'm still just kind of dealing with things. You know, again, I was All out, right. so I'm going to be. But now I'm not. I'm not planning on taking any prolonged time off. So I should be back with more regularity now. So I feel like every time we've done the <laughs> the pen cast has been like, well, I wasn't really here, so I don't have anything to contribute. But that should get better. Awesome. All right, folks, that's all we got for you today. Nice, healthy, meaty, hot dog burger of a pen cast. I uh, wanted to thank you for watching. Please leave us feedback about how we're doing. Leave us comments on YouTube or elsewhere. We have an email address if you're an audio podcast listener that you can email us at pencast at googlypens.com if you so choose. And on the way out here, I'll leave you with a random fact uh, that Chow Smith was always an avid runner and in 2017, she decided that for her 70th birthday, she would complete seven marathons in one week on all of the continents. So one marathon each day on a different continent. <laughs> it sounds crazy. Traveling made it challenging. For example, Smith made the race in Egypt just minutes before the start because her plane to Cairo was delayed. But despite the obstacles, she completed her goal. 70 years old, seven marathons, seven continents. How cool is that? I don't know what to say about that because I literally cannot <laughs> comprehend such a thing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I mowed my lawn this week, you know, <laughs> and I feel accomplished. Oh my God. Isn't that wild? 70, man. I mean, it just, I mean, seven marathons ever would be impressive. Seven yeah, marathons like one in marathon seven days. <laughs> Yeah, seven marathons in seven days is impressive. Like going Antarctica to seven, too. Like seven yeah, continents. Go, yeah. Go, going to seven continents at all is impressive, but th th all of that, oh my God. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Jeez, pretty that's, wild. That's, 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 that's amazing. 70, my God. It's pretty cool. Anyway, that's what we got. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Drew. Appreciate you Thank doing you. Thanks for cluing us in on the, uh, on the thing and helping Brett for the pencast. Everybody, have a wonderful week. We love you all. Thanks for watching and right on.